Now, I have never asked God one time in 29 years to keep me sober. Never asked him once. I thanked him a million times, but I've never asked him once to keep me so. Because that's not the way I read my book. The way I read my book, it says, here are the steps we took. When we took them, something happens. When we don't took them, nothing happens. So, I told Father Barney, I said, I've never asked God to keep me so. He says, why not? I said, I think that's not his business. I think it's my business to do these things, and his business to take care of him. And he's done it. I don't have to tell him what to do about his business. And you guys told me what to do about mine. And I do it. Here are the steps I take. I'm sober. And many, many good things have happened in my life, including the disappearance of the related disorders. <laughs> which I didn't spend five seconds on. Not five seconds did I spend trying to get my wife back, or the kids, or my job, or my health or my sanity. And somehow or another, it sort of all fell together. So God's will for you and for me is fulfillment, peace, and joy. The gift of God was made the foundations of the earth. What you came here looking for, you came looking with. But we have to find it where it is. And it's right here. And it's an inside job. It's an inside job. Uncovering, discovering, and discarding is alcoholics not. Fascinating way of life. And it gets better for 29 years to my certain knowledge. And I suspect it's going to get better forever. World without end. Amen. <laughs> God bless you all. That's it. <laughs> talked about the fact that everything that we were conditioned to believe was true about life in home, school, and church has had to be reversed since we grew up a little bit. And, of course, this includes uh, getting out of our own way, self-discovery. It includes surrender when we were conditioned to believe that surrender was for the weak. Strong man wins, weak man surrenders. <coughs> So, we had to run our own lives. We had to win the battle. In this new way of life, we have nothing to win, nothing to prove. And we're not going anyplace. Nothing to win, nothing to prove, and we're not going anyplace. <clears throat> now, I'm either going to run my life and take the consequences thereof, or I'm not going to run it and take the consequences thereof. One or the other of those things I must do. We cannot do both. Again, it's written... That you can't serve two masters. Either you cling to the one and despise the other, or vice versa. A house divided against itself can't stand. So either I'm going to run my life to take the consequences thereof, or I'm not going to run it and take the consequences thereof. And they don't mix. 
And I can't run mine. As we have said, we had 43 years to run the show. During which time, I was the star of the show and the master of ceremonies. And after 43 years, I had accomplished failure in every department of life. So I can't run my life. I can't run nothing. Can't run my business, can't run my wife, can't run my kids. Can't run anything. And I knew it. I knew it when I got here. I came here knowing that I had lost the battle of life. And I'd given it everything I had. I gave it my wife, my kids, our home, my job, my health, my sanity, and my money. And I lost. <clears throat> so I can't run my life. It's no, it's no big deal as far as I'm concerned, however. Because I don't need to. Because I've lived for 29 years in total expectancy of guidance and direction. So, I don't need to run my life. It isn't necessary. And I can't. And I accept it. Now, the next premise is that God is either sufficient unto all of my needs or he is not sufficient unto all of my needs. One or the other. If he is not sufficient unto all my needs, there's nothing to worry about. Because in that case, life is not worth the candle. The sooner it's over, the better. We might as well knock this thing off and go down with the bus and fill it full of liquor and shack up <laughs> and drink till we die. If God is not sufficient and all our needs, sooner so the better. There's nothing to recommend life. So if he is not sufficient, there's nothing to worry about. And if he is sufficient unto all my needs, there's nothing to worry about. So I got you both ways. <laughs> got you both ways. Because if he is, all I have to do is to act like his kid and prove that I am. And that's written like this. Act as though I am and I will be, says the Lord. Act as though I am and I will be. So, that's all I have to do. To act as if it were true and prove that it is true. And that's what we do in this program of ours. There's nothing else to do. There's nothing else to do because we've already lost. We've already been to human power. The best I went to, the priest, the preacher, the doctor, and as we said to the guy who knew more psychiatry than there is. <clears throat> and every one of them talked to me about willpower backbone stand up and be the man. Every one of them. Because, you see, prior to 29 years ago, almost nobody knew anything about alcoholism. The people I went to see, the authorities, did not know anything about alcoholism. And they couldn't help me. And I didn't know anything about alcoholism, and I couldn't help myself. So I had to keep right on drinking until the bottle killed me before I could even come here to investigate. Now, I knew that my job and my problem was not 
But the lack of willpower, or the lack of backbone, or the lack of being able to stand up and be a man. I knew that. I was born with a pitchfork in my hand. I can't remember when I wasn't working. I always worked. <laughs> And I was a pretty good athlete in my day. And I can say that without fear of successful contradiction, because there's nobody here old enough to remember. <laughs> <laughs> and my backbone had never given me the slightest trouble. And you know something? It hasn't yet. My backbone did a hell of a job for me. If everything I have worked as well as my backbone, I'd be in top shape. <laughs> if you want to make a question on that, talk to me tomorrow about it. <clears throat> so, it isn't backbone. It most certainly is willpower. And there is ever a group of people on the face of the earth who has willpower. It's the drugs of the world. Boy, we got willpower to burn. <laughs> I can get whiskey in Kansas on a lecture day if it fell on Sunday. <laughs> it depended only on how I was walking off the sidewalk, how long it took. Any place in the country. If the need was great, it didn't take very long to get a jug. <clears throat> Every time I hear these earth people talking about backbone, willpower, I want to ask them one question. How many of them ever crawl a mile in the mud after dark just to get a bucket of ice? It's <laughs> part of the course for a drunk. We got a whip right bird. And in the standing up and being a man department, we can give them cards and spades. There's ever a bunch of philosophers on the face of the earth. It's the drunks of the world. We have all the answers for everybody but us. <laughs> One of our great... Assets, one of the things that really endeared us to the non-alcoholic world. We have always known exactly what was wrong with them. And we didn't mind telling them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a not a good way to win friends and influence people either. <clears throat> We're a great bunch of philosophers. You can go right now into any bar in this part of the country and ask the first drunk that you bumped into any question that popped in your head and he'd tell you. <laughs> he wouldn't stammer and stutter. He, didn't, he wouldn't say, I don't know. He'd tell you. <clears throat> A great bunch of philosophers. So... I knew all the time that my problem was not willpower, backbone, standing up and being a man. But I didn't know what it was. So, I had to keep right on drinking until I died before I could come here and find out. Now, this isn't any criticism of doctors. Or the preachers, or the priests, or the psychiatrists. Because they didn't know. And back in those days, they did not know. <clears throat> it's a comparatively recent thing that doctors and priests and preachers and psychiatrists, a great percentage of them, have made it their business to find out something about the disease of alcoholism. And they can pre presently tell us <clears throat> and tell us where we can go for help. But in my day, this was not true. Thank God. 
There's so much more known about it today than there was then. That many people can find out and come without having to destroy themselves, as some of us did. <coughs> However, Mr. C says to me quite often, supposing I had have known something about Al-Anon back in the days when you were drinking, supposing Al-Anon would have had, had been here, and I was in it, and I was knowing a little bit more about how to handle you or how to treat you, not handle me, but how to treat me. Do you think that it would hasten you into the society before you came? And I say, I don't, I don't really believe it would have. In my case, I don't really believe it would have. Because I am one who certainly could not hear it like it's here. And could not see until I could see. As I told you the other day, I read Jack Alexander's article in the Post. In 41, and five years later, I remembered that I'd read it. I had four sheets in the wind when I read it. And I remembered only two things about it. That drunks helped drunks and didn't drink. And they called it Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's why I said to myself, if I ever live to get out of this bed, I'll find a aid. And from the decision until now, I haven't had a drink. <clears throat> so I don't know. In my own case, up until my last drunk, it was never my fault that I drank. Up until my last drunk. And I got drunk for 25 years. And I was a periodic for the last 10. And I was physically sober down tonight. Between every two drunks for 10 years. And I could look at my record. With physically sober eyes. For that whole 10 years. And yet until my last drunk it was never my fault that I drank. It was your fault. It was my wife's fault. It was her mother's fault. Now there was a king size reason for getting drunk. That mother in law of mine. <clears throat> Reminds me of a little story I picked up from Al Badger in Dallas. Al's gone to the big meeting. He was a hell of a guy. He was about three or four months before me in the program. We soberly died a year or so ago. And he was a great storyteller, and he told this story. He said there's two drunks who met on the street. And one of them says the other house things. Oh, he says, not good. Well, he says, that's bad. He says, not so bad. He says, uh... I got married. Well, he says, that's good. He says, not so good. He says, I got my mother-in-law, too. Well, he says, that's bad. He says, not so bad. Uh, she's got money. But he says, that's good. He says, not so good. She wants to boss everything. He says, that's bad. He says, not so bad. She bought us a house. He says, that's good. He says, not so good. The house burned down. Well, he says, that sure is bad. He says, not bad, brother. He says, she burned, too. <laughs> <laughs> Until that last excuse has got to go to the boards. It's got to burn up. If you and I have, if you and I have one excuse left, that is still acceptable to us. We have another drunk left. Nobody is going to do the things necessary to obtain and maintain sobriety. <clears throat> if there is any way to pin this on to anybody else, your mother-in-law or your boss or anybody else. We're not going to do it. In my own case, 
I don't remember if I told you this down here or not. I've told it many, many times. But on my next to the last drunk, when I went to the kitchen after a glass of buttermilk, Dick and Miss C were sitting in the living room. They heard me let out Beller and heard me hit the floor. Came running out thinking that I was in an alcoholic convulsion, but I wasn't. I was just lying there on the kitchen floor as peaceful as anybody ever saw. Doing nothing, but they couldn't wake me up. And they told me I was a peculiar color. I was blue. <laughs> they got all exercised. And called the oxygen squad. And they came down. And after a while, he woke me up. And, uh, they told me that, to all intents and purposes, I'd been dead. That they'd had a hell of a time bringing me to, and nobody would ever bring me to again under those circumstances. And he told me if they were me, they wouldn't do that anymore. I remember I told you that. But I did it again. But the thing I want to tell about this time is this. That about 24, 36 hours after they had brought me to, I was able to get the old dirty bathrobe on and start walking off this drunk. Now, that's the way I had to sober up. I never heard of an easy way to sober up until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. The only way I could sober up was to die until I could live. And I did it mainly walking. And I've got the old bathrobe on and I'm walking up and down the living room floor, back and forth, sweating, freezing, shaking, dying, and walking. Miss C was standing over the fireplace. And I was walking away from her. And she said, Chuck, don't you think you might get a little help if you'd read the book Alcoholics Anonymous? I turned on her like a lion. I said, you, my very own wife, suggesting that I read a book written by a bunch of drunks. I have read all the good books for the good authors. And you want me why I said you wound me deeply. Now, I've just been dead 48 hours before. And she wounded me deeply. And I polished her off completely by saying, and besides... <coughs> I can write a better book than that myself. Now, that was just 90 days before I came crawling into this program. Just 90 days. I've been getting drunk for 25 years. And she wounded me deeply by suggesting that I read this book. So I doubt very much that there was any way that I could have gotten here except the way I came. And that was to totally burn up, which happened to me in my last time out. Now, many times people hearing a guy like me, or some of you, who had everything happen to them that can happen to anybody, and they say, well, those things didn't happen to me. I've never been in jail. I've never had... Uh, I've never had convulsions. I've never had trouble with elephants. You know, I had a lot of trouble with elephants. I may be one of the few people that ever lived in Beverly Hills that were charged by a herd of elephants. That almost never happens in Beverly Hills. They were running me right out of the town. No convulsions. I've had them all. And they say, well, those things haven't had me, happened to me, therefore I'm not an alcoholic. Now we think, we think, that there's no degrees of alcoholism. You can either drink well or you can't. One or the other. Alcoholism is a great deal like pregnancy. A gal don't get any more pregnant in eight and a half months than she was 15 seconds after conception. 
It just shows more. The same thing's true with us. I don't think we get more alcoholic. I think it just shows more as time goes on. <clears throat> and it don't make any difference how many of those things you've missed. You know whether or not you can drink well. And if you can't drink well, you might be an alcoholic. We say in this dealing of ours, if alcohol interferes with your personal life, your business life, or your social life, any one of these three, maybe, any two, perhaps, and the three of them, you're a cinch. But there's another little question that I like better than all three of those. And it's very, very simple. Is it necessary for you to wonder whether or not you're an alcoholic? If you are, sign up for the secretary before you leave. <laughs> I have never caught a non-alcoholic wondering whether or not they're an alcoholic in 29 years. It's always been an alcoholic that's trying to figure out some way to beat this rap. So it isn't how much or where or when. It's what it does for you. I'm mindful of a number of years back. We had a doctor in San Francisco quite a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He was a gynecologist. As a matter of fact, he was five times uh, a doctor. He was a doctor, a surgeon, an obstetrician, a gynecologist, and a psychiatrist. He was qualified in all those fields. And he told us a little story. He said he was operating a lady who was Getting pretty well along in years, past 60. And he had determined in her examination that her arterial tree was very weak. And uh, he had also determined that she'd never had a drink of liquor in her life. And for a post operative care, he prescribed a little brandy. And they started giving this bitty a little brandy. And he said on the third day after the operation, she stole the keys from the nurse and got into the brandy. And she never had a drink in her life up until that time. So it's not how much or how long, it's what it does to us, you know. And you can either drink well or you can't. And if you can't, this program is for you. And the quicker you embrace it, and the quicker you do something about it, the better. Because alcoholism gets worse, never better, in this manifestation. I'm actually 29 years worse off so far as success for drinking liquor is concerned than it was when I got here. And I know it. <clears throat> I know it. And I don't have to take a drink to prove it. But I've, because I have been close to and active in this program for the whole time I've been here. And when you're close to and active in, all you got to do is keep your eyes open. Your friends are forever taking that drink for you. So you don't have to take it. <clears throat> they do your experimenting for you if you keep your eyes open. Now, there are two or three little things that I want to add to this before I take off. <clears throat> when I first got here, I was quite sure that people who had not suffered as much as I had suffered couldn't possibly love this thing as much as I did. And I felt a little bit sorry for those who came and hadn't had some of the things happen to them that I had happen to me. Because I knew that they didn't, you know, they couldn't feel this thing like I did. 
And then I got to work again with uh, Jerry Priest. Never been kicked out of anything. Was still serving the altar. But he was a priest. A Jebby at that. And it gradually dawned on me that I was a drunken nobody. Nobody gave a damn whether I drank or didn't. Half a dozen people. But a Jebby priest. How much they mu must suffer <clears throat> in doing a bad job. And I got to working with my banker. And he was one of the biggest bankers in the country. He was an internationally known banker. He taught banking. He was a dollar year man with the United States government for quite a while. And he never ventured got anything. He belonged to everything in town. Never been kicked out of his home. He lived in Fremont Place. You can only get in there and out one way. <laughs> no cross streets, no out to the other end. You go in and out the same way. It's private. There's where he lived. And he'd never been kicked out of home. Never been kicked out of But he couldn't drink well. And he wasn't doing his job well. And he came to Alcoholics Anonymous. <coughs> and when the time came, when he felt that he had to start trying to give this thing away, he went to his committee. He was chairman of the executive committee of one of the biggest banks in the city. And he went to the committee and he says, Look, I have an alcoholic problem. And I have found a way that might let me live for the rest of my life without drinking. And one of the things we must do is to work with alcoholics. And he says, I'm going to have to start working a bit with alcoholics because they've worked with me. And I'm sober. And I'm going to have to talk a bit. And two of them might know. And it might be damaging to this bank. And so I'm submitting my resignation to this committee right now for your action. And they said, go to your office. And he went out. And he was almost to his office when they opened the door and called him back. And he says, whatever you feel that is necessary for you to do, do. And we're with you a thousand percent. Isn't that beautiful? And this was one of the most humble men I've ever known in my entire life. Up until the time he died. He's the guy that allowed me to buy my business. Beautiful, beautiful man. And we used to sit between Christmas and New Year's every year and have lunch in the California club, which he belonged to. I didn't. <laughs> but he did. He belonged to everything. And he'd sit there and tell me that uh, that lunch with me between Christmas and New Year's every year it was a high point in this year. And I'd sit there and bawl like a baby. Fabulous man. Never got kicked out of anything. But how he must have hurt. How he must have hurt. So I had to come to see. That it's not possible for you and for me to decide how much somebody else is hurt. We don't know what's going on inside of somebody else. And they might have hurt ten times, a hundred times worse than I. And yeah, I was sort of pitying them. <laughs> because they couldn't love this thing as much as I did.
Also, I knew very well that when people didn't practice these principles, like I thought they should, they couldn't stay sober. Our book tells us we cease to fight anything and anybody, or everything and everybody. We cease to fight. We had an old boy in our group in Beverly Hills that fought everything and everybody. He was a year and a half sober when I got here. And he's a year and a half older than I am in the program right now. And he never did quit fighting. He still fights, and he's practically a dead man. Now, back in the old days, I used to try to make him speak to me. And he wouldn't do it. Maybe a whole year go by, we're in the same group. <laughs> and I couldn't make him speak to me. And I'd do sort of stuff like this. I'd walk up to him in the middle of a, uh, a sentence, talking to one man. Because he, he had to, you know, he had to do something. Well, he did. He turned on his heel and walked off without even finishing the sentence. I couldn't make him talk to me. And when I got my 21st birthday, he gave it to me. And this roughneck kissed me on the neck when he gave me my birthday cake. He may be one of the guys that loves me the most in this town. So, we have to come to see that it isn't where you are. It's where you came from. Now, Eddie just might have grown ten times more than I did in this program. But he didn't start even with me. He started down the ladder ways. And so we have to come and see these things. And it makes for much, much, much more beautiful living experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, there's a little verse in the book, which I won't quote, because the doctor don't want me to. <laughs> but it says this. <laughs> it says, Blessed is he who condemneth not himself in that which he alloweth. Blessed is he who condemneth not himself in that which he loves. What does that mean? I believe it means that if you can do a thing without condemning yourself, it's not so bad. But if you condemn yourself for it, you better jolly well quit it, it'll kill you. And I think this is one of the greatest differences between a a good old Saturday night drunk and an alcoholic. Because you and I condemned ourselves from the beginning. Now, if we were raised in a religion that did not condemn us for moderate drinking, maybe we didn't condemn ourselves for moderate drinking, but we condemned ourselves for a bad performance. So, from the beginning, we condemned ourselves. I knew better than to drink before I ever took my first drink. I condemned myself from the first drink. And as time went on, the condemnation became hatred. <clears throat> and we end up hating our guts. We can hardly look in the mirror to save. Because of self-loathing. Blessed is he who condemneth not himself in that which he alloweth. Now again, this tells us this, that there's no particular way that you can classify 
so called sin amongst those people around you. Many people can do things that I can't do and don't condemn themselves at all. Personally, I could do things, many things, five years ago that today I cannot do. And so it depends on where we are, what we can do, and what we have to get rid of. And it's a continuous process. Because the higher we go, the more we have to discard. And the more we discard, the freer we become. It's amazing. There's no such thing as the meaning of a word. Now this blows my mind. And the way it came about, I got to thinking some time back that the first two and a half pages in chapter five, which add up the end of C to about 450 or 60 words. That's all there is. And uh, I never counted them, but I think that's about it. And I have gone through that not less than 25 and probably nearly 30,000 times in 29 years. About them, they're new. The words remain the same, but we don't. And it depends entirely where we are, what they mean. And they will always be more meaningful. They always take a new meaning, depending on where we are. And we'll be walking up this ladder forever, world without end, amen. Now here's another thing I like to think about, sitting up there on my hill. I believe that I'm right in this, and if I'm not, one of these sailors can correct me. I think that when you're sitting in a boat at water level, on a clear day, the horizon is seven miles. I think that's as far as you can see. When you're, when you're at water level. Now I'm up maybe a thousand feet. Above the water level. And on a clear day, my horizon is almost limitless. 150 miles, I can see. Sometimes, Catalina Island, San Clemente Island, and Point Furman are all close enough that I could seem like I could skip a rock to them. You know? Just that little bit of elevation changes the horizon from seven to maybe 150 miles. And we'll be walking up these stairs forever. <laughs> Now, the only thing we can't change about our lives, the only thing that cannot be changed by us, is that we're stuck with ourselves forever. World without end, amen. Now, this is a bleak prospect, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> we get to thinking about committing suicide, you know. You can't make it. You can't make it. You're stuck with you forever. Everything else in life isn't changed. You don't even have to go home from here if you don't want to. You can go someplace else. You don't ever have to see your wife again if you don't want to. You never have to see your kids again if you don't want to. You don't have to stay in California. You don't have to stay in the United States. 
You can change everything in life but one. You take it away from you. <laughs> You're stuck with you forever. I'm stuck with me forever. Now it would appear that when we get here, they would try to teach us how to be friends with ourselves. But they don't. They teach us how we have to work with other people. Be sure that we make a good impression on the neighbors and the people around us. You know? We have to show respect to our elders. Particularly the priest and the preacher. <laughs> and mother-in-law. <laughs> But they don't tell us how to get along with us, how to become friends with ourselves. Now, in my opinion, sobriety, the definition of sobriety is the ability to live comfortably, peacefully, and joyously with me. This is sobriety. Nothing short of it is partial sobriety. When I got here, we didn't think of these things. When I got to the program, all of us thought if we hadn't had a drink today, we were sober. And we talked much about putting the plug in the jug, putting the plug in the jug, putting the plug in the jug. I never had any problem putting the plug in the jug. I was periodic for ten years. And after every drunk, I put the plug in the jug. Periodic have to get sober. No way a periodic can keep from getting sober. Because we're pigs. We drink everything there is that's too thin to chew. <laughs> and we drink it all. The time when it comes when we can't get it down, we can't get it up, and we can't live, and we can't die. So we have to get sober. So I never had any problem putting the plug in the jug. I quit forever. With and without a thermos. <laughs> Put the plug in the jug. My problem was not putting the plug in the jug. It was taking the plug out of the jug. <laughs> because when my time came, I took the plug out of the jug. And I was off again. So, physical sobriety is absolutely important. To me, it's, uh, it's synonymous with life. I cannot live and drink, and not myself I can't keep from drinking. So I have to be physically sober, lest I die. So I am not selling physical sobriety short. It's the foundation under sobriety. But sobriety is physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Four parts of the same thing, and it adds up to the ability to live comfortably, peacefully, and joyously with me. This is sobriety. <clears throat> now, this program is more important to me today than it was 29 years ago. Because 29 years ago, if I had just died and had it over, it would have been the greatest thing in the world. I was born knowing that suicide wasn't an answer. But it never occurred to me that drinking yourself to death was suicide until I was sober five years. So I tried my damnedest to drink myself to death, but I couldn't make it. You can't drink yourself to death if you want to die. The guys that die with alcoholism don't want to die. If we want to drink ourselves to death, we just go nuts and stay nuts, but we can't get over the bridge. 
I want to make this point. One of the great big insurance companies of the country was built by a man whose son, that's over in Alcoholics Anonymous, he was an attorney and he was never going in the insurance business. He was going to stay an attorney. And it was a beautiful empire. And I don't know how much effect I had on him, but I would talk with him for a long, long time. About getting on in that business and taking over, because his dad was way long in years. And he eventually did. And he was the man that built his empire. And he was pretty old. And he was doing a bit of drinking. And his son talked to him a little about it. And he said, I can drink myself there if I want to. And his son said, no, you can't. Well, he said, so and so did. Mentioning another big man in the insurance business who had drunk himself to death. And the lad says, yes, but he didn't want to. And it hit me like a ton of brick, because that's what I was trying to do. But I couldn't make it. The thing that hastened me and the Alcoholics Anonymous after 25 years. But I, I knew I wasn't going to die. I was going to stay insane. And I sit there in that chair of mine, thinking about the boys, my boys. When the kids in the block says, where's your dad? And they say, uh, he died. And they turn and walk off. Because they couldn't tell him I was in Patton. But just enough left to know how to tie my shoes and why I was there. You know? That kind of dreaming drives you nuts. <laughs> it drives you nuts. So it helped to drive me in here. We can't make it if we try. And it never occurred to me until I was five years sober that drinking yourself to death was suicide. But of course it is. Now, how am I going to stay sober? I have to be sober. Sobriety in life or synonymous. How am I going to stay sober? I'm going to so perform that I'm comfortable right here. That's the only way I can stay sober. When I get to be in a certain way right here, I'll get drunk. Now, I hear many people say that if you've been in Alcoholics Anonymous a while, you have to think to drink. I don't believe it. I don't think you have to do anything but quit doing the things that keep you comfortable right here. And you wake up drunk. Because, you see, you and I are no way to stop that big hurt. And if we allow it to hurt like it used to hurt, we'll be just as drunk as we were in the old days. And we don't have to think about it at all. Just quit doing the things that keep us comfortable right here. Now... I believe with the doctors that alcoholism is a disease. I believe that it's terminal. I believe that it's a disease of twofold nature, and allergies of the body coupled with impression of the mind. I accept all this. But I do not believe that that's all there is to the disease of alcoholism. If it is merely mental, and physical. A good internist and a good psychiatrist could take me apart and put me back together and I'd kick. But this doesn't very often happen. To us once in a while somebody gets sober and stays sober. But it doesn't often happen. So, there must be something else to this deal. A 
living problem, and we must have a living answer. And inasmuch as there has never been a mass recovering program for alcoholics, that did not include a basic spiritual rest. Then it seems kindergarten to me that the problem behind the problem is a basic spiritual unrest. Now I say often when I'm about ready to quit talking the time has to come to in our lives when we come to see that if there be fault, it's mine. If there be fault, it's mine. And I say if there be fault because I don't believe there's fault. I believe that you and I are the victims of a combination of characteristics which came with us. That made it impossible for us to integrate ourselves into the life that we're born into, into this so-called civilization that we're born into. And I look at myself and a few thousand of you people, and it seems that there are three Characteristics that are common to all of us, so common that they're so easy to see. In every one of us, regardless of race, color, creed, religion or the lack of it, education or the lack of it, which side of the tracks we were born on don't make any difference. Every alcoholic that I've ever known. Almost throughout the world. Is a perfectionist. An idealist. With the terrific guy for excellence. That goes with perfectionism. It is this drive. For excellence. That brought about the. Cliche that you've heard ever since you were a little guy. This is the best we can if we ever had the shop, but the best lawyer that ever hit this part of the country, but the best stenographer we ever had in the office, but she can't get down till about other Tuesday or Wednesday. <laughs> Thanks too much. Terrific dry excellence. Perfectionism. Now, perfectionism is a beautiful characteristic or attribute when we learn how to live with it. But until we do, it'll kill us. It makes us set goals for ourselves that we cannot attain. And we're forever disappointed in our own performance. And it makes us demand more of those around us than they can put out. And it makes it necessary for us to make them over. Our wives and our kids and the people that work with us and so on. It's a killer until we learn how to live it. Perfectionism. Idealism. And it's very evident in all of us. The second thing is that to a man, we were born with the interior awareness that life should be a good and a big and a beautiful thing. I knew when I was six years old that life should be like it is now. My insides proclaimed it. 
But I looked at it and it was cheap and it was dirty and it was ugly. That was one of my biggest problems. I couldn't integrate myself in the life around me because I didn't like it. There was a scene, if you remember, in the days of Wine and Roses. It just closed the heart out of me, and I haven't had a drink for 29 years. Every time I think of it, it does me in. This gal had come back to her husband's apartment to try to talk him, her ex-husband's apartment, to try to talk him into rejoining her in the drinking world. And he'd gotten into alcoholics nuns. And he was building her to join him in this new way of life. And she was standing looking out the window, high above New York City. And she finally said to him, I can't, I can't, I can't. When I look out of this window, sober, it's cheap and it's dirty and it's ugly. And when I look out drunk, it's beautiful. For 25 years, the only way I could stand what I looked at was to be half in the bag. And this is one of my big problems. And yours. And lastly, there are many more, but we'll just use three. And this is the most incongruous thing you'll ever hear come out of the mouth of an alky. And I caution you not to speak of this to your psychiatrist. <laughs> we are a highly sensitive people. <laughs> Now, ain't that something? When there we lay in the gutter, and the pig got up and slowly walked away. <laughs> We're a highly sensitive people. And that's the reason that the psychiatric world, from one end of the world to the next, has labeled us as being emotionally immature. They want them. We're emotionally immature. I don't believe it. I think that we have several times the capacity for feeling that the psychiatrist has. The psychiatrist came in and found me lying there on the floor in front of my big window. When this was drunk, I couldn't even get up. Crying my eyes out over a beautiful sunset. Emotional immaturity. He don't know it's so damn pretty, I can't stand it. Now again, I haven't had a drink for 29 years. But a year ago, I was down on the knobs above Louisville, Kentucky. Along the Ohio River. I was in October, and the leaves had turned. That's the most beautiful sight on the face of the earth. All those beautiful colors. And miles of it. It's so beautiful. I sat there all alone in my car and bawled my eyes out. It's pretty, couldn't stand it. We're not emotionally immature. We are highly sensitive people. Now, as I've told many of you, I've been in prisons all over the, practically all over the world. Mostly as a guest. <laughs> I could leave after a while. <clears throat> and amongst them is Folsom. Now, Folsom is for habitual criminals. You can't, in, you can't get into Folsom for murder if it's the first time. <laughs> You have to be a habitual criminal to get in Folsom. They tell me up there that the swallows that build up there in those rocks used to build in Capistrano. But they're four time losers. <laughs> so they build up there in the stone wall around that place now. 
I stood there and talked twice this many people or three times this many people. And watched them cry right along with me. And the tears bouncing off their bellies and they make no attempt to hide it. And it isn't because they're emotionally mature. It's because of the identity. They feel right here exactly like I do. And they cry with me and they laugh with me. And it isn't because they're emotionally mature. Now I'm convinced that people like us, when we get here, have all the characteristics for alcoholism except alcohol. All we have to do is add a little alcohol and we're off. Very few things can happen to us. From the time we're born, we're either going to be priests, preachers, or nuns, or hotheads or alcoholics. Because we cannot integrate ourselves into the life around us. And it's not because we don't want to, because we do. We want so much to be a part of. And we're forever apart from. And so, this is our problem, a basic spiritual unrest. Unfortunately, the teachers don't know the answers. I, uh, bury a few people. I think I told you I had two this week. Monday and Tuesday, I had funerals. <laughs> two months ago, I was asked to give a little eulogy for a 16-year-old girl who had taken an overdose. Cocaine. That's the end thing down in my country now. Cocaine. And she died. And I got out there to the place. The cemetery. Because there was no chapel. Deal. It was just graveside service. And that whole hill was covered with kids. I don't know how many, just the whole passel of kids, teenagers, on that hill. And I said to myself, this can't be just a regular deal. I've got to talk to these kids. And I talked first for a little bit with their parents. And there's a few older people that were there. And I told them that I didn't believe in death and why and so forth and so on. And then I started talking to the kids. And I told them I had great empathy for them. Because I too had been born into a society that I couldn't swallow. I couldn't integrate myself into. And I had to find a way to be comfortable. Because I was not comfortable in society in which I had to move. And when I was 19, I found a way to get comfortable in that society. And for the next 15 years, I used this chemical for an answer. And it was an answer. For the first 15 years... But after 15 years, my answer turned on me and became a problem. And in the next 10 years, it made it necessary for me to find the right answer. And I did. And then I told these kids that if they could just come to see that there was an answer, that stayed with us. He says, when you're behind the acid, you got all the answers. 
But when the answer's gone, he ain't got none. The answer's gone, too. You see? But there is an answer that stays with you. And it's so much better than any chemical that you can put in your body. That you can sing about your business. Business of living. And you don't have to repeat a dosage of chemicals. And if you just decide that you want to find this answer and make an effort, you can find it. And there are many people that have helped you. And if you do this, maybe this life will be, this death will be justified. Her mother called me the early part of the week. First time since I had been there. And she said there was an, uh, quite a movement amongst the teachers and amongst the students to find an answer to replace this stuff. And she told me about some guy that's throwing his house open to kids there in Laguna Beach. And they wanted me to come down there last Friday, but I was, I had to do something else and I couldn't go. Friday a week. But isn't that beautiful that they might now be looking for something that might take the place of this chemical deal? And I want to close with this little story. <clears throat> Before Alcoholics Anonymous was born, there was a chap by the name of Roland. And Roland was an alky. And Roland was doctoring with Dr. Carl Jung, who might possibly be the greatest psychological mind that the world has produced so far. If I was learned, that would be a good opinion, but I'm not. But to me, he was top. He was the same vintage as Freud and Adler and Jung. But it seems that Jung had a personal answer. He had a living answer, and maybe the others didn't. And Roland was doctoring with him. And every time he came back to him, he was worse. And he finally came back to him, Dr. Jung. And the doctor told him, he says, Medical science has done everything in its power for you, and it can do no more. Psychiatrists, psychiatry has done everything in its power for you, and it can do no more. And that's my duty to tell you that your only hope is to find a spiritual experience that might save you. It's your only chance. Now, this was some little time before Alcoholics Anonymous was born. And eventually, Eddie called on Bill. And eventually, Bill heard the pronouncement that we've talked about already. He might have six more years, uh, six more months to live, and then his wife would have to either lock him up or bury him. And he called out, God, if there be a God, reveal yourself to me now. And something happened. And he got sober. <laughs> and he shared this thing pretty well until he died. Never had drinking. Now, after he and Dr. Bob and some of the rest of them had worked out this formula and had proven that it worked if you and I worked it, and had put, put it in this book for us. Bill heard about Roland. And his... Uh, uh, what Dr. Jung had told him about the spiritual awakening, his spiritual experience being his only chance. 
And Bill Rope to Dr. Cardinal in Zurich, Switzerland. And he asked him in the letter, how come he had known enough about alcoholism to so counsel Roland as he had done? And Dr. Yu wrote back, and he told Bill, in essence, that he had always known that the alcoholic problem was his search for unity. His search for unity, and he couldn't find it. He even quoted one of my favorite verses. <laughs> As the heart, H-A-R-T. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. He'd always known that this was the alcoholic's problem. His attempt to find unity with the life around him and with the God that made him. And when he found the bottle, it seemed to be the missing ingredient. It seemed to let him live a little bit more comfortably with himself and in the, in the society around him. And he had found chemical unity. And it did a pretty good job with him until it became the problem. That only a spiritual answer could solve. Now, that's a beautiful thing. And most of us agree with it. Now, here's what happened. And this is uh, this just curled my hair. This is fantastic. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to me. Roland, having heard this, affiliated himself with the Oxford movement and got sober. And he ran into Eddie. And he got Eddie into the Oxford movement. And Eddie got sober. And Eddie called on Bill. And Bill got sober. And so the things of God. Oh, this is so beautiful. In our entire history, the finger of God is so evident all the way through it. From Dr. Carl Jung to Roland to Eddie to Bill, Bill to Dr. Bob, and Dr. Bob and Bill to us. What a beautiful thing it is. And how fortunate are we, I believe us to be, the most, in, the most fortunate segment of humanity, of God's kids. Because, you see, we have to. We have to find an answer lest we die. You come here not looking for God or to get our wives back or to get the love of our kids back. Not even looking for help in many cases, like my own. But just a way to live one day at a time without drinking so that we might rub out a little of the record. And we find that the formula for sobriety and the formula for the good life and the formula of God are all the same. And we find an answer that makes the chemical unnecessary. And it's, it's an answer that don't stay in the meeting when we leave. It goes with us. And we're never alone anymore. How fortunate can a man be? God bless you. Thank you very much.